Welcome back, everybody, to CMask. I'm here with Will, Mike, and Tim, as usual. Tim and I just got back from a wedding coming to you from yours truly uh, and us by return, which is what sponsors, quote unquote, sponsors this CMask podcast. Um, we just had our first wedding, very exciting, in less than a year. So June 20th, we opened the doors for us by return. End of July was one of our first matches. And Wednesday, this Wednesday, we had the first marriage. That was a very beautiful, traditional, intimate, modest ceremony administering the holy sacrament of marriage um and will totally wish he could have been there man they were so they were so grateful for the service it was the answer to many years of prayer so any young guys or women we do have women who watch this channel about 19 percent of the viewers of cmask are women which is very cool if you guys are looking to get married within 12 months if you're serious about this if you're serious catholics uh we have our first marriage. The second one is coming up soon. We have another engagement and we have a bunch of couples going steady. So that's what the C-Mask podcast is brought to you by, brought to you by love and matchmakers. And so we're doing part two of what we did last week about the architects of, of romance. And uh, today I want to talk about the, the schoolyard paradox, as I'm deciding to call it here. So from our time in the schoolyard, the foundation of heterosexual romantic interactions has been something like the following. If a girl likes a guy, she'll be mean to him. And if a guy likes a girl, he'll dismiss her. And to violate this rule imperils the romance. And so it's sort of like an eternal game of chicken where both people are infatuated with each other and neither one's willing to express themselves first and somehow both of them collide and admit to one another their affections and a relationship begins. And as we get older, this evolves into more sophisticated strategies and heuristics and rules and guidelines and red pill podcasts and books. And men and women are supposed to do follow these heuristics in order to avoid the public humiliation that they believe would have taken place in the schoolyard had the two kids been vocal about how they felt. And so these rules, these heuristics include, but are not limited to, I'm sure you guys have heard of many of these. Maybe you've even advocated for some of them as I, as I have uh, men being encouraged to take one and a half times the amount of time it took a woman to text him back, to text her back or to never use a particular set of or any emojis while texting. Uh, or men are told, focus on your careers. Women are the accoutrement. They are not the purpose of your life. Focus on your career, and the women will find you uh, after years of success. Uh, men are encouraged by folk like Mr. Rolla Tomasi to engender dread in their women by overtly engaging in and encouraging sexual tension with women who are not their wife in front of their wife or their girlfriends uh, or to plate spin. And then on the woman's side, women are encouraged, especially Catholic women today, uh, culturally are encouraged, don't be available. You always got to be busy. You always got to be hard to pin down so the guy can chase you. You got to be aloof or they're encouraged to shit test their guys endlessly. And then men are encouraged to neg the women, which is to say to insult or be belittle them in a, in a blasé manner. And I believe this all sort of distills into something Rollo Tomasi said in his book, The Rational Male, which is that the, the sexual mating strategies of men and women are mutually exclusive. It's a zero-sum game. Both parties, according to Rollo, cannot succeed simultaneously. I, I get the feeling from all of these rules that that is the abstract 
ethos of the rules. And what I find confusing and nuanced about this is that in all area of, areas of our lives as men, we are encouraged to be earnest and forthright and honest in word and deed. Our words must match our deeds. And in one area of our lives, in this area of our lives, never under any circumstances can you allow yourself to behave in perfect alignment with what's happening on the inside. So today I want to unpack all of these rules, these heuristics, and see if there's any truth to them and what the balance between self-expression and also maintaining polarity and romance is. So to begin, just want to go around on first First reaction to the topic won't go in any particular order, just if any of you guys have any thoughts on that before I get into the specific. I have 12 specific points that I want to go through. Well, I think most adult, pleasant women, um, I find the opposite. The only time I think I'll ever disagree with you, Nick, is um, in my experience with my wife in particular and going on dates with you know, decent women before that, um, women can't help but make it obvious that they're into you. That That's is their nature. Yeah. yeah, that is their nature. I think there is some truth to when a woman is younger that she'll try to kind of ignore you or stiff arm you because she's you know, maybe you make her insecure or you know incite some kind of a reaction in her that she doesn't know what to do with or how to deal with. But adult women in my and in, in my experience, they can't help themselves. They touch their hair. They can't maintain eye contact. It's incredibly obvious um, when they are they're into you. At least in my experience, and mm -hmm. with my wife, it was, <laughs> I'll make fun of her. It was, it was very clear that was the case as well. And I think that's very endearing. It's an endearing part of female nature. They just, they're so, um, uh, you know, their state of emotionality, the way God wired them, that's, they, they just can't help themselves, which I think is a good thing. Now, in terms of how a man should express himself, I think some guys, they, they need to keep this in mind, right? The more that you've built yourself up as a man, the more, and I think I talked about this in the last in the last podcast too, the more grace she's going to have for you in your expression. And that point of origin is also important too. Why are you expressing yourself? Are you expressing yourself because you want to get validated by her? Well, that's kind of simpy. If you're expressing yourself with really not caring what her reaction is going to be, I think that's a more masculine frame, more authentic place to operate from. So in my experience, in terms of like the texting back and 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 those nuances around communication, I'd built myself up in such a way that, you know, I had, you know, the physique and the business and my life was headed in a certain direction. So for the first time in my life, when I was dating my wife, there was no rules around this. I texted her back immediately when I could. It wasn't a game where previously there was a game. And honestly, that game is anxiety inducing and stress inducing, and it's not authentic. And I didn't respond to her right away because I, I, I cared about her validation. I just wanted to talk to her. So I think for those guys out there, if you're a skinny, fat nerd and don't have much going for you, yeah, like when you when you do stuff like that, it's going to give them the ick. That's why, you know, your primary focus should be your, 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 your purpose and fearing God, the wisdom that comes with that, your career, your physique, et cetera, et cetera. And I think game is, I don't think you will really have to worry about game at that point. I sure, I never did. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything Mike just said. And I think I intoned it quite similarly privately on the phone last night, Nick. I, I don't relate much to um, the schoolyard paradox, um, aside from very, very downstream of it. <clears throat> uh, you have Rollo telling men to be mean to women and and um, feminists, uh, female fem feminists, Rollo is a male feminist, telling women to not be available I, I agree with that part but i i don't think that the ex extrapolation of the principle holds um in this way because I, I like i said it's not just like the one good woman the the best head and shoulders best woman that a young man meets which will be his his wife is going to be decent to him when you go on when you date a lot you know man women in general when you date decent women Women in general cannot help being super nice to you, being nicer to you than everyone else. This is exactly what I was saying. Uh, I even gave you some examples of, of girls I dated in my past, Nick, where I'm like, well, this wasn't the one for me, but man, she thought I was the one for her. And she was so maybe grouchy in this way or always wanted to talk 
like theology and science in another way, but I, I didn't want to spend my life doing that, but these were good, good women. And, um, when, when women respect the man they're with, that's the main thing they need. They'll treat him so well. Even if you're like, you don't always as the guy, I think this is an important dating tip. You don't always as the guy, young men out there need to be like, Oh, this woman's treating me so well. I need to be here. You, there's something else you need to be getting from it. Like that doesn't prove ipso facto that um that this is a couple it's it's literally a question of are you in the kind of head and and heart space that you know you want to be in with your future wife that's the big question women women if you're a respect worthy guy women will treat you really really well so i just don't straight up again usually we agree on most everything i just i just don't relate to this one i think um if you're a good guy out there if you're a good catch, women are just going to, they're going to feel lucky to be courted by you. But that this doesn't mean that they're not being prodded to claim they're, they're, they're not available, which is a horrible thing. And we should, we should talk about that downstream of it. And, and men shouldn't be prodded to be mean or, or especially keep their wives in dread. That's, that's just horrible. This is just insecure people insecure or feminist men, insecure feminist women essentially are just population control advocates. And that's all it ends up amounting to. It's interesting, Tim, the idea of men needing to be encouraged to be mean. Because when I was a teenager, meanness just came naturally. Like I was just mean to girls and they <laughs> liked that. I was mean to a lot of boys as well. And they found that funny. And I think there's something interesting about the kind of crowd that has to Google um, how to get girls or like how to be confident. And they do need some of these rules, like don't use um, 50 emojis after you make your own joke because that kills the joke. Don't be too keen to reply with 10 messages to one that she says, whereas normal guys don't really have to be told that stuff. So there is this overemphasis on trying to dial back how guys express affection for people who struggle with it, like as a corrective. But I think what Tim's saying there is that for a lot of people, these kind of thoughts aren't really at the front of their interactions with the opposite sex. So when I first met my wife, I can remember the first time we actually made eye contact. Um, and it reminded me of that scene, you know, in The Lion King, when uh, Simba flips Nala and her pupils go wide and you just think, oh, there's something here. There's a connection here. And I can remember it clear as day right now, even though it was what? I was 13. I'm 38 now. So a long time ago, I can still see it in that moment. And I was open with her. I told her um, soon after we met that we were going to get married just as a little 15-year-old kid. And then we did. So I wasn't pretending that I didn't like her. And that yeah. wasn't a turnoff to her. It was probably scary being told that, but she liked it. I actually uh, told my wife before we went on our first date, we hadn't even met at this point, said you and I would make some beautiful children. And here we are with two beautiful children. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I too told all... my wife before our first date that that I, I could marry her. And she knows I dated a lot too. So that's, yeah, you have three out of three um, kind of a set piece. There, Nick, like, nah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think um, young men out there, maybe, maybe we've come across our first truly generational issue. Zoomers who grew up on social media, this is more relevant, but when you're having most of your interactions in person and you're talking about confident men that expect to be treated well by any girl they take out, not just the one then yeah you're when you meet the special one the one that not only treats you well but the one that makes you you have the fuzzies every time you're with her your your future wife the, the last thing you want to do in the world is be mean to her but i like what will said i was i was a mean teenager i wanted to fight every dude that wasn't in my immediate circle i tried to fight a lot of guys and i was i and i i mocked you know in a kind of holden caulfieldy way most of the girls, you know, as conformist, brainless cheerleaders. And I was just kind of mean. And yeah, so there's there was that. But when when I actually liked a girl, that was when I'd kind of let her in, whether I, I fell in love with her or not, I'd let her in and I would be nice to her. So I just don't relate to the being mean 
for its own sake to girls. I think that that's a very Rolo, very, uh, let's say, Jewish Muslim way of covering up an insecurity that I think might be more frequently activated on social media with with people that that use social media as a bigger part of dating. It was it was very little um, by way of a centerpiece to me in my dating life or, or probably probably will or Mike as well. So that might be one ex explanatory gap cover. There goes the new channel. <laughs> just <Yeah>. nuked. <laughs> I, I noticed oh. um, with the first episode we did on this topic, Nick, people were thinking that even buying a ring at all, maybe even a string ring, a, even a string ring, it's simping. Any Dude. kind of expression of affection or getting any ring, even um, proposing is simping. So and this is what I'm saying. I, I don't. I don't know that you guys are um, as in contact with the present uh, feelings of pressure that perhaps it's my my generation is most under with respect to this because of exactly like what you're saying there, Will. The comments like that where they they really are being told and instructed. And this is sort of where the the show topic came from and tim that i've expressed to you it's like you know tim that i i suffer from the opposite not from not from wanting um or not not from not expressing myself but from expressing myself too much and it requires a tremendous caloric burn to restrain uh, my earnestness in most instances but the reason why i'm expending such energy is because there's this overarching societal pressure and heuristic this 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 boogeyman which is like if you express your heart with earnestness it kills something something dies you're, you're gambling in a, in a dangerous way there um and so this is where the rules come i was literally just on youtube shorts yesterday uh sam sent this to me uh it was some no name red pill influencer guy, black guy wearing a, a tight button down shirt, leaning into the microphone saying three emojis you should never use when texting women. He's like, <laughs> if you're gonna send if you're gonna send a heart, make sure it's the black heart and not the red heart, and never use anything that involves a monkey. And don't use this. And I'm like, okay, and yeah, it might not apply to the four of us or or even you know, half of the guys watching this, but like this is what is occupying the concerns of men who are trying to to court women out there like if you if you express yourself in the wrong way it's going to kill the romance and i do think that there are specific rules or heuristics that are worth um discussing maybe we should start with um with women and this idea of availability will you look like you're going to say something i'm just going to add in one point nick just to drop it in here to develop later these are the same guys who are also afraid to get married. 99.99% of the time, yes. the yes. ones who are afraid to signal that they're interested and, and show any kind of affection, also terrified of marriage. So also, so I, yeah, I would just add to Will's point, lest we devolve into a cultural relativism, not a spatial culture, but a, a chronological um, generational culture of relativism. All, all cultures are not the same. I think Zoomers are very, very bad at dating and, and very, very bad at developing interpersonal skills in real time, walking up to a girl, forming a connection, not knowing. Because like, yeah, I'm, there, there is a, a chronological primacy to, well, like I said last week, you never bring flowers on a first date. What Flowers express intimacy that's there. Well, why would you do that? You're, you're meeting a stranger. There's no intimacy there. You're seeing if you have a connection. In generations past, you just understood this. But when you live your life on the internet, you're like, oh, I'm going to give her flowers on the first date. That, that's retarded. And, and that wouldn't have been something that you had to tell even young men who are kind of new at dating in the year 2000. In 2024, it's all theoretical. Uh, or being in person is theoretical rather than meeting someone online and using all the gay emojis. So I do think that, yeah, of course, like we're not saying to overexpress yourself. That's not it. It's it's using the correct nuances and using the correct do's and don'ts, which are like a, a common, a, a natural law proposition. Well, of course, you don't give flowers on the first date. And again, a first date shouldn't be 
some elaborate thing where you're trying to narrowly tailor to a bunch of her tastes. That's that's another thing that's very common that I, I get emailed about all the time. How do I set up the first date? Go to dinner, maybe go to the movies or go to a coffee shop afterwards so you can talk. There's no, You don't try to get too smart here. And the dating shows on on TV for the last 20 years haven't helped that. But I, I just say, yeah, we're 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 not saying to overexpress yourself, young men. That's not what we're saying. It just sounds and, that way when we're not distinguishing properly. And it, and it's an easy way to, to to protect against that is so many guys are making women their purpose instead. And what would made it very easy for me, and I don't, you know, didn't have to worry about game was I had a vision of my life and what I wanted a wife and a mother to look like in in a home. I had this very clear vision down to what the, what the house looked like. And that allowed me to just express myself very clearly and authentically without having to worry about game. The problem is on the other side, these guys don't have a purpose. They have a job that they hate. They're not, they're kind of just floating through life. And so these women become their purpose and it comes across in the way that they communicate. And so men don't realize that uh, a woman is not meant to carry that the kind of weight of that kind of pressure. They break under that pressure and they flee. So if you know what you're doing, you know where you're going, um, you know what you want from your life very easy to communicate and, and not come off as a quote unquote simp. And another thing too, I've inevitably seen all of the, the men in my life, the, the friends that I have that have had to really, really over game the women that they're dating, they eventually get cheated on or ends up in flames. You can only white knuckle a situation like that so long until you break or something happens. And it's just simply the wrong choice. That's well, it. There is a paradox endemic to what you guys are describing here, which is that don't make women the purpose of your life, but also career is not the purpose of your life. Your vocation is. So assuming that these men aren't supposed to become priests, they are supposed to become fathers and husbands, which is to say that a woman is more of a purpose of their life than the Fortune 500 company that they may or may not be a part of mm -hmm. or the startup that they're creating. So this is the balance that I guess I'm trying to elucidate here. It's, it's, it's much deeper than texting. It's the fact that as a man, a well-ordered man, your telos is to become a husband and a father, assuming you're not supposed to become a priest, which 99.9% .9 of the people watching this will not become priests. So how do you orient yourself towards your vocation instead of a career without falling into the trap that you guys are describing, which is the deification of the woman? Well, it's first off, that's a great point because it makes sense of why the anti-marriage red pill community and before people say oh it's not anti-marriage Rollo literally says that marriage is an unconscionable contract that means he can't recommend it in good conscience like it's saying don't get married um the reason they have to be so on guard against simping the whole time is because that's where they're constantly tending because they're not interested in marriage when you're focusing on a woman and you have no intent to marry her which is how you actually honor women by keeping them in their proper place as god has instituted things if you take that away then you're constantly on the edge of simping so of course they're talking like this but for a guy who's going to get married and have that as his vocation the simping danger is not there as long as he understands that uh, god is involved in this and being married properly means honoring the woman in the hierarchy that god has actually instituted she's not the most important thing in his life. His career isn't either. God is. If you don't have that framing for marriage, then you can become a married simp as well. And there was a big mistake made there when marriage no longer became a, a sacrament with the Reformation. And then it descended into something that homosexuals can also have as well. And it's all about just how you make each other feel. And then you get the happy wife happy life nonsense of feminism as well. And the man feels that the main thing he has to do is constantly express affection and try to walk on eggshells around his wife the whole time. Because what is marriage at that point, other than just how you make someone feel? So what I'm getting from that is just, a, you know, is, is some guys just overthink this stuff to no end. What you're, What I think you're saying is the purpose is in the duty, not the person. So it's not, it's your purpose as a, husband and a father leading a home virtuously, keeping a woman in her proper place and respecting the hierarchy that God has instituted in the world versus the person herself. Does that make sense? I think that's an important distinction. 
Yeah, right. There's two levels to it. So as a natural institution, the purpose of marriage is um, procreation, or we could put it more bluntly and just say patriarchy. That's literally it. The man is the head of the household, and that's how you build up strong societies through strong families. So the purpose of marriage naturally is patriarchy. And then as a sacrament, it's about you and your wife helping each other to become um, saints, and you ideally want to try and get your kids to heaven as well. And none of that involves making her your primary purpose or simping either. So whether it's on a natural or supernatural level, um, you have to be willing to uh, maintain frame and stand up to your wife and do everything for the greater glory of God. Does that make sense, Nick? The impersonality aspect of, of what you're proposing, Mike, seems to contradict a lot of a, Old Testament, and I'm not actually using that in a pejorative way this this episode um which is that god seems to have a high level of selectivity for the wife uh, whether it's in in many 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 old testament books and stories the wife really matters to the specific the, the specific person of the wife matters to the specific husband who she is um what her story is which sister, which cousin, which tribe, you know, Hosea, Rebecca, all, all these stories, it seems to be very specific. So it doesn't, I don't jive with the idea that it's simply a duty, especially when we're talking, and I'm, I'm not necessarily making the argument that there's, you know, soulmates or whatever, that you can't, that every man can't technically speaking be compatible with every woman, because that's how nature works. But rather that Marriage is a specific discernment process. Like all of you guys chose your wives and kind of called it from several miles off mm -hmm. that like, yeah, no, it's this one. I've had all these options, but I want this one specifically and for a specific reason. Cause like, this is going to work best. So I don't want to get too impersonal here. And this is the, the knife edge that I do want to remain on for this episode of, okay, you guys wanted one particular woman mm -hmm. in specific You know, and another another point, which hopefully we can join these two back together, is with respect to career. Um, I I know Tim, your story more than Will and Mike with respect to the early days of your career, but what you kind of start out planning as a young man or even wanting to do is not necessarily something that you're going to be doing five, ten, or fifteen years later into marriage. Don't you guys think that? A guy should be able to be like a professional stamp collector, and as long as he's sort of a mensch, as long as he's a, he's a, a real a real one, that the woman shouldn't really care about his career. Or do you think that men should always be striving for, I don't know, whatever the highest expression in their domain is? Let Let me say my piece, and then then my answer to that question will make more sense. So. Uh, you you know if you take Aristotle and Thomas at their word, you have two teloses teloi. One, one's natural, one's supernatural, and the the natural purpose is eudaimonia, uh, final cause of your life. If you're not a priest, you're married. Uh, you get to eudaimonia eudaimonia through children, and you get to children through getting a wife. So that that's what we mean when we say the natural purpose of your life is a moral happiness through really procreation. I think this immediately, um, Ipse Dixit, dissolves some of the, the confusion around, well, does the one wife, does the, the person of the wife immediately satisfy all of like the wants that a, that a man will have? Or should he kind of be into his own thing and then she's interested in that and that creates the intimacy or, or whatever you guys were attempting to express it's really children and yeah your best friend is going to be your wife the person you procreate with but i, th I think that explains it far better um the, the of course the supernatural end is unified it's becoming a saint like will said and the, the very catholic thing that the, the protestantism really destroyed is the connection um of the supernatural and the natural. You get to the supernatural through the path. So the natural path of eudaimonia, T 
together with Jesus gets you to heaven if you live that path well. And again, if you're not a priest, the way you do it is because Jesus elevated, and this is also why I think some of those Old Testament expressions of marriage are misleading to you, Nick. Jesus elevated marriage to the dignity of a sacrament at the wedding feast of Cana. That's that's what the catechism said. So that Old Testament stuff where it's like, oh, God had pre-appointed this daughter and all, all these kind of soulmate -y, Old Testament soulmate -y sounding things are no longer applicable. Like if you marry someone, and this goes for all the young marrieds that are having difficulties or the middle-aged maybe divorces, get back with your wife. If you get married in the church, you have, by virtue of the Christian sacrament, not um, in not being enforced, not existing yet at the time of the Old Testament, you have enough grace to make it, even if you made a bad decision. And I've always told people, marriage is not a discernment process where you're listening for a special calling. I specifically tell men no on that. Listening for the priesthood, that's a that's a kind of discernment, an attunement of the inner ear or whatever. I don't know. I never, ever felt a calling for the priesthood. Never, even a little one. But when marriage, I just knew I wanted to meet, uh, I wanted to marry the best woman for me, the one that struck me immediately. And my wife struck me immediately in the way that, um, Will and Will and Mike both into I wasn't didn't even know their stories, but yeah, I, I said before we went on one date, I, I could marry you. So having said all that, I made those distinctions. Now, um, th does the answer to your question, Nick, almost present itself a little more obviously? How I'm gonna how I would answer the, the your new question? Yeah, I mean, I have a suspicion. Just because we've yeah. also talked behind the scenes a little bit about this, but yeah, what, with what do you think to, the answer would be with respect to the career? Answer. Yeah, because career career doesn't matter. So, do I do I do think a guy should just be interesting. He's interesting mostly for what he does, but it doesn't have to be professionally. If a guy's, uh, I mean, like someone just mentioned to Owen Benjamin, I mean, he's he's an interesting guy. You know, he gets gets the Trinity completely wrong, but block that for a second. It doesn't really matter if he kept being a comedian professionally. He's going to be entertaining to to live with for some woman, the right type of woman. And there's a type for that that will be very interested in that, even if he stops being a comedian, which I think he kind of has, or he's just sort of a YouTube comedian on his own channel. Um, it's very Protestant to conflate your profession with vocation. And I, I, I just obliterate this in... Um, uh, chapter five of Catholic Republic, your purpose is not your profession. That is pure Protestantism. Max Weber describes it in a thousand page book. Um, it, it's just no, no, no. It's very American. Uh, there's a guy called, uh, you know, um, well, I'll say this. We know it's not your profession because it has no telos. Besides, it subserves your actual purpose, which is your vocation. You can do anything to make money okay. to, to support your family. But you should be interesting to the woman. You should be interesting to the woman for your personality and the things you're doing and the things you want to do. But they don't have to be professional. They probably aren't. So the purpose, the telos of a man's vocation is to relate and communicate with his wife and his children. Well, the uh, vocation is, uh, shares identity with what we would call his natural telos. You wouldn't say the telos of his vocation. You'd just say literally, uh, because telos is the, um, the man's goal, is eudaimonia through the married life, the layman's life. And right. eudaimonia so, that way is through procreation. The purpose is procreation. Right. But the thing that the man is supposed to be concerning himself with in his day-to-day -day life is his relationship and communication with his wife and his children. Well, I wouldn't Not say that. I mean, yeah, all, all of, you know, it's it's procreation and getting getting you, your kids, your wife to heaven. That's the connection to the natural one. And then everything you do is subservient in some secondary or tertiary way or quaternary way to your goal. Your goal is getting you 
one woman and all your children to heaven. And everything you do, including profession at the base level, but which church you pick at a higher level, the kinds of activities you do with your kids and your wife, those are all in subservience to just getting them to heaven. And that will mean you'll have a nice, happy, play together, pray together, natural life on the way. You know, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, be with us on the way. You'll have a nice life, but it's it's about that. But I would say procreation is the natural, the natural um, expression of man's natural telos if he doesn't become a priest. That's beautiful. That's beautiful because I'm I'm getting aspects of my old Protestantism worldview. Just like it's just collapsing on itself when you talked about the the distinction between uh, vocation and and career. That topic in particular is not spoken about enough. I think I just wanted to say that, Matt Tim, amazing. I think that's edifying for me to hear that. So I can imagine the uh, the, the listeners. Um, Nick, in the um, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. We read this interesting line, which I think might partly resolve the tension that you're hinting at here. The husband should also be constantly occupied in some honest pursuit with a view to provide necessaries for the support of his family and to avoid idleness, the root of almost every vice. So does that help to integ uh, integrate where um, career falls? in this vision of marriage that you're outlining here. So almost constantly occupied with actually providing for his family in some honest way, because that's just part of what marriage entails, especially as your family grows. So career has to play a big part in your life just for that material necessity of needing to provide. Sure. I don't feel like it helps, no. <laughs> what? Uh, why is that? Let's see if we can figure out why. I don't disagree that a man should be occupied. It's just there seems to be a, a paradox with... He's supposed to be concerned with his relationship of his primary concern, and it, it, it must be the case that his primary concern is the relationship with his wife and his children. He can't just get them to heaven mechanically. He's not delivering a package. That is a relational enterprise. Mm -hmm. This is every criticism we have of the boomer generation is a failure on that. So his relationship with his wife and his children is paramount. So in as much as a career is relevant, it's subservient to that end. So material provision, and I guess making sure he's not like idle such that he becomes vicious in his behaviors. But that, the form of that can be plumbing, or electrician, stamp collection, or president of the United States. It doesn't matter what that is. As long as it makes uh, money. I don't think stamp collection makes money. But, <laughs> but if it did, it'd be valid. Stay out yeah. of wood. You can do anything as long as it's honest. Mm -hmm. So collection costs money. You I don't think it. Money. I don't think it. It necessarily helps or hurts the the conversation. It's just more of like if if it is true that the primary concern of a man is the relationship with his wife and his children. How then can he make that his primary concern without dissolving romance and polarity? So. I'll I'll propose another question that I have here, and, and maybe this will um, to redirect the conversation better. So, in in case for patriarchy, Tim, you talk about the Moon Beasley complex, and in brief, that's women are very feminine prior to marriage, very seductive, very alluring, and post marriage, they are encouraged and compelled to become quite feminist, uh, quite unattractive to their spouses conscientious objector, objectors and such. I wonder if there's something similar with men. And Will, I think you, you probably deal with this more than anybody helping men in struggling marriages. If there is a Moon Beasley complex for guys where prior to marriage, they're focused on their careers, they're mysterious, they're, they might be somewhat aloof, maybe a little brusque with the women. Maybe it takes them a bit of time to text back. 
and they get married and they they focus too much on their wife. I, I think there's a way to do this. There's absolutely a, a problematic way to focus too much on your wife. And I'm not arguing against that. But what, Will, what do you diagnose is happening when you get messages from these guys saying, like, my wife doesn't want to have sex with me anymore. And you tell them, focus on your career. Like, what are you diagnosing and why are you saying this? I think it's more common that the man has actually failed in his duties to uh, be constantly engaged in some kind of honest pursuit. So meet the material needs of the family. He's also failed in his duty, again, outlined in the Trent Catechism, to keep all his family in order to correct their morals and see that they faithfully discharge their duties. And some guys do that while being extremely financially successful. So I see both types. The one who are just failing to meet the basic material necessities, and that's causing constant marital strife. And then the others who might be wildly successful financially, but they're not really giving their wives the uh, the companionship and the leadership that they they owe them because that's what marriage is about and both i think can kill the intimacy and authority in the household i think is most it... commonly sorry you're gonna finish your point no no go mike i was gonna say most commonly with the guys that i've worked with too it is usually some combination of that even the you know the financially successful ones they're out of shape they lack frame they're really passive in their own homes they kind of just like melt into the couch and um, they actually uh, possess no authority despite being in that role of father at the home. That's most common for sure. Um, it's it's disorderly in that way. And I can speak in my own experience of it being actually the opposite for me as I got into marriage. I was so focused on all these other things that I actually neglected my wife. I neglected romance and dates and courtship and continuing that process, the, the continual courtship process in marriage. You know, it's kind of a funny thing to say. Which leads to pretty much like the exact same thing. You know, uh, she, you know, she doesn't feel like she's, you know, loved on. Um, she doesn't feel like, you know, she's really heard or communicated with. Now, this can go too far, as Will and I know with the guys that we've, we've worked with. But sometimes you get guys like me that are a hammer and everything's a nail. And we completely like almost like forget about our wives. and like, oh, we married her and now she's good. And as long as we're taking care of her in such and such way and I stay in shape, things are fine. Um, they're not. Because that the grass, the, the 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 garden of your marital union still needs to be watered. And so this is a very helpful re reminder for guys like me, very type A, want to lift all the time, make more money, all of this stuff. And I think I'm doing such a good job in all of these things, whereas my wife, it's like, well, when's the last time we went on a date? Okay, but also dig important. dig into that for me, Mike. You've identified the, the right bound where this is, becomes problematic, a type A career-oriented guy. And in order to to resolve that, you identified I'm failing in companionship and therefore I must do X. Can you just dig into that for me? What did you have to do? What were you insufficient in? Well, I, it was it was I was almost treating her like a business partner, right? Where it's we're always just talking about business, we're talking about this or that, but there really really wasn't much conversation around um, you know how she was experiencing motherhood, what she was going through as far as like recovering from, you know, postpartum or how loved on she felt from me. Like I I found myself, there were times where I didn't remember the last time, like I went up and touched her, you know, even just nonverbal things like that. And so it took her to communicate with me and saying, Hey, like, I don't actually feel like I'm here with you. I don't feel like you actually like love me. And at first, you know, my ego goes up and say, look, look at everything that I've done for you. Look at everything. She doesn't care about the surroundings. She does to an extent, of course, but she cares more about how, you know, we're interacting with one another. You know, is she, is, is she feeling hurt or is she feeling dismissed? Because many of those times at the end of the day, end of a work day, what have you, um, she would want to talk to me and I was just checked out and I would just kind of give her these short answers. She didn't really feel like I was investing emotionally in what she was experiencing and much less taking her out and actually f making her feel like she was loved on and and, and special. I just find that so amusing how depending on which side you're coming from, you're making a mistake with what you just said. Like if you're, if you look at what you're describing with how you resolved the problem, by the way, I think everything that you're saying that you did is, is beautiful and wonderful. And I would support and recommend and do myself. This isn't me. I'm just trying to explain the landscape as I see it right now, which is, so you were too career focused and, and in an attempt to heal this relationship 
and become more of a companion with your wife. You did things that so many people would classify as simping and the gay best friend and like oh you you listen to your wife you know you're 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 hugging her now and now she's your your gay best friend sort of thing and it's like well then the opposite of that is you know you both will and mike you guys get these messages all the time i see them when will you post them on twitter where it's like women are like on reddit anonymously posting about how their husbands are so distant from them there's there's no relationship whatsoever and so i guess what i'm saying is like there's this an indefinable an undefinable perfection golden mean is there a principle that we can lift out of that for how to for how to reach it in each situation because you can't just say focus on your career or you'll screw up in that direction and you can't just say like be a really good companion to your wife because then she's going to get the ick because you don't have any purpose to your life per se it's like what's this principle that we can abstract out what i don't i don't think will or mike can say this because they're they're coaching a lot of these guys one-on-one -on -one, but when guys are retarded and and normies are clueless and uninteresting that that's that guides things so so people are it's like if someone had to do origami the, the top quality origami to like get let out of a, a pit Whatever, whatever it's called, like, you know, imagine Silence of the Lambs, you know, the, the weirdo guy, Buffalo Bill or whatever, is not going to let him out of the pit until you make a perfect origami. And they are allowed a lifeline. They can just call the origami expert who's trying to tell them. With retarded normie guys, I, I'm not saying they can't be coached out of it. I'm not trying to, they, they can't, they can, but they sort of have to ask 50,000 questions and blow up the analogate for a second. It's not origami. It's just like this should this stuff should be common sense. Yes, don't focus too much on your career. But yes, don't sit around and like bring her flowers 24 times a day. It's just just avoid both extremes. It's pure Aristotelianism. You got to the guys, the the main character, the protagonist, and everything's on his shoulders making the money keeping everyone uh, on the straight and narrow, going to church, doing, you know, the guy provides the hobbies and the entertainment. Everyone just goes with him. The kids come with me to, to NBA basketball games. That's one of the main things we do. We're going to go see a movie. We usually go, we'll, we'll do some kid movies, but the kids kind of like to come see the movies I want to see. The dad sets the whole frame. So if the guy's deferring to his wife, and just tending to her nonstop, giving her bonbons and flowers all day long, which is what I do see a lot of. And then Will and Mike say, don't do that. Be more independent. Then you're like, I just think you're kind of making a paradox out of um, virtue ethics, which is the expression of the golden, the habituated golden mean. It's not that complicated. Like everything's not a paradox. Just don't tend too much to your wife because you have nothing going on. You're boring and uninteresting, which is a, a few and a many problem to quote aristotle again this is just what boring guys do they're gonna make a they're gonna make i hate to quote a protestant but uh calvin says the human heart is an idol factory you're either making an idol out of your damn work which is protestant or you're simping to your wife which is kind of also protestant they're, they're, they're two extremes just be in the middle you should be an interesting person with pursuits if you're blessed enough to make money through passive income then have other pursuits and and just do stuff at the very least, be someone that doesn't allow your kids to to just go your own. Another thing with simpy guys in the burbs, they're always doing exactly what their kids want to do, not just their wives. It's their kids and wives. I notice these guys, because I'm in the suburbs with a lot of them, a lot of them are in my neighborhood. Like, oh, we're doing the princess fest and this and the butterfly fest next weekend. And then after that, we have dance and tap and whatever shit they think little girls and wives like i'm like they should be going to your thing man they should they should be like oh dad we're going to i don't like monster trucks or like wwe wrestling but if that's what the dad likes it's a, a patriarchal home and i talk about this in case for patriarchy too the kids and the mom want to go to his thing and they're passive observers that's a maybe a big part about expressing the the median here and i just don't everything's not a paradox it's just it's just the golden mean like, don't be too into your work. Don't be too into your wife. Either extreme expresses a very boring, normie kind of loser guy with nothing going on.
If you're too into your work, it means you're a boring normie. If you're too in, not too into your wife, like you can love her too much, but if you're tending to her too much and she's not sort of tending to you interested in what your interests are, professional or, or, or recreational, then it just means you're boring and it's going to turn her off and it's bad for your marriage to do either, either way. I'm, I'm definitely not talking about Mike here. Alpha guys, if they're going to air, they tend to air on the other side, like Mike was saying. But um, obviously, Mike Mike's a very interesting guy, and no one's lives their life um, hovering over the mean nonstop. But I mean, I, I just don't think everything's a paradox. Does that make sense? It's just it's just the geometric mean that is Aristotelian. I don't think it's that complicated. But but the um, once you allow in the the the, the secular the red pill assumption that all and any emphasis on companionship is simping, then the whole discussion is screwed. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Yeah, of course. And three I, things come to mind too. When we, sorry, well, finish your point. It's all I, good. I, honoring your wife as a companion is really all we're talking about here. Everything Tim just said, honoring her as your wife means honoring her as your companion. And Eve was made uh, for Adam because it's not good for Adam to be alone. And honoring her means keep her in that proper place as a companion, not more, but not less either. That takes some skill and it's hard to do. And lots of guys screw it up. But to say that being affectionate or romantic at all and doing that honoring is simping means you've misunderstood what marriage is. Yeah. And three things come to mind too. You're like, how do I strike that golden mean? Well, I don't think you're ever really going to get there fully. And like Tim said, I don't think it's that complicated, but three things come to mind. Well, grace, first of all, because we're both sinners trying to become saints and we help each other to become saints. So grace and mercy is needed in this process where sometimes I veer to this, this, this side of the, uh, of the fence. My wife is going to call me out lovingly. Okay, great. I do the same thing to her, which leads me to the second point was humility is to understand and hear where she's coming from. And sometimes it's great and it's true. And sometimes it's, it's not. And the same thing for me. Um, and I'm always reflecting on myself where I'm trying to be objective and say, where am I neglecting or abdicating my duties as a husband? And the third one too, and this is where guys fail is testicular fortitude. Can you say no to your wife? Cause if you can say, if you know how to say no to your wife, you've got a lot of this already well accomplished, you're not going to become a simp if you already know how to say no to your wife, if you know how to hold it down in the home, because you'll be able to learn the distinction between holding space for her, which is not always needed, and then just kind of closing down a conversation and, and shelving it. Because either one of those two, both of those things are needed in a marriage. Sometimes it's like, this is actually nonsensical. We're not actually ha not having this conversation. And you just walk away. And sometimes you need to actually sit there and listen, grace, humility, testicular fortitude, and you kind of you're going to and prudence. Prudence, the wisdom, yeah. know the difference between those right. scenarios. Right. Absolutely Perfectly right. expressed. Yeah. yeah, perfect point. Do you guys feel this is more of an individual question for each of you? Personally, and then broadly speaking, that men want to be known by their wives. And then uh, I can put more gloss on what I mean by known if needed in the sense that the the woman is the glory of the man and that man is the glory of god that idea so people can tell something about what you're all about as a man by reading into your wife almost as your mirror no more more as in like be open with her so she knows us really well yeah, so the the general desire expressed by womankind is well, I just want to know you, you know, what your demons, your your sins, your fantasies, your fears, your insecurities. Like I just tell tell me everything. And the the general response to that is sort of like to a kid asking how the magic trick was done. It's like, you don't, I'm not going to tell you. Cause the moment I tell you all of these things, the moment you have all of that information, sort of all of the wonder evaporates. But what I'm more curious about is, do you think that it is a desire of a man's heart, generally speaking, to want that level of intimacy with his wife, that, that knowledge? Yeah, I think guys will open up to, women in the way that they don't to other guys 
Sure, there are some forms of male friendship which can develop different kinds of bonds that are good, but they're normally focused around the pursuit of a shared activity, especially war in particular, has forged lots of really intense male friendships. Think um, Lord of the Rings quest style stuff. That's one element of male bonding. But when we think about the fact that God made a, a, a woman as Adam's companion and men and women, as Aristotle says, are not just physically but psychologically complementary then there's a potential for a deeper friendship there. And over the course of a lifetime, um, whether the guy really sets out saying, I really want to share parts of myself with this woman or not, it's going to happen because what is it? I think the the science on it is about 55% of communication is nonverbal and about 38% of it is um, is vocal. And only a tiny bit of it is actually verbal. So you're communicating things about yourself um, mainly when you're not even using words and she's learning things about you just through body language and habits and how you respond to her. And she gets to know you better than any other guy would anyway, just because she's spending so much more time with you. And does that surprise us? No, because that's what the one flesh union is really about. Yeah, I, I think that's a perfect answer. I was I was going to say, I've, Stev has never said to me that Judeo-Buddhist kind of emo thing, like, tell me everything like that. <laughs> Anyone who knows Steph would never say that. But I'm always impressed what she does. Like, there's some stuff that I think she would openly say, I don't want to know. Like, she's had all C-sections for all of our kids. And one time, the idiot, like, nurse led me into the room the front way, and I saw her literally spilling her guts. Uh, you know, I did not want to see that angle of, of the, you know, the front part of a C-section. That's too much information. Steph knows me better than anyone. And she is my best friend, but, but there are times when I could express something and it would be too much. And a, a guy who I'm less close with overall would be able to handle it better. But in, in general, aside from emo music in the early 2000s, late 90s, and a lot in the Judeo Buddhist films, you know, it, it kind of kind of artiness saying, "Just tell me everything. I want to know everything." And Michael Scott says it too. Charles Minor, <laughs> um, tell me something you've never told any other human being. That's just not a, a realistic. Um, there, it, it's just a very corny, I think, expression from a woman to a man or a man to a woman. Like there are, it's not a game. It's not game. This is no. We're not talking Rolo Tomasi tactics. It's just. That's not something you ever say to another human because it's utterly, utterly, uh, it prescinds from propriety. It's like, no, I mean, if someone's your best friend, you don't need to say that. That that might be a kind of Hallmark film way of of trying to rush. But um, I think, I think you, you know, if you're talking about something that that's meant to be private and you hold on to just yourself, yeah, like fears. I mean, Mike and Will are, are very... Um, tough, cool dudes that, that have been super honest the last two or three weeks. And I'm trying to match that like vulnerability. Like I had a horrible April in the last five years, just in terms of headspace, I had a, a anxiety filled April and Nick, you know about it. If you, if I go around just focusing on how bad April was, I'm glad to be in May and I, I I'm feeling better. And you know, I just, over the last five years, that was probably my most anxiety filled, uh, health conscious month uh, in a long, long time. And I'm, I'm glad to be over that. But yeah, just sitting around and talking about that nonstop in like an emo way is not it's not good. It's it's good to ignore some things or to try to sublimate. Yeah, that's well said. And I think my wife has never asked me the the that question ever. And I think it's just one of those things that it, it kind of just gets revealed over time and going through seasons right. with a person. And I, I just think it how you show up in that is important because one thing that comes to mind always is I, I need my wife to know. So she knows where I'm at because she can just, I'm just an expressive guy. Like when I'm quiet and she sees a look on my face, she knows something's going on. So wh what do I have to gain besides she knows like, stop trying to be cool. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I'm just trying not to tell you this is what's going on, but I'm not trying to like uh, burden her with it. She's got enough. She, she needs to worry about what I think every guy should try to exude is yeah, I'm struggling. I've got this. And I appreciate your support and your encouragement, but I've got this. And so it's like, she can know those things. It's not a bad thing. How do you show up in that? Um, but that question itself, 
I think men are too preoccupied with this fantasy of that conversation, how they handle it, when like most women just don't ever ask it. Hmm. And if she does, I think it's a bit of a, I think it's a bit of a shit test. I, I like find a LARP it the, um, or something. The, I think more a LARP than even, or it could be either, but it's yeah. like that. They're just, that's not what intimacy requires. Like, I mean, literally Michael Scott says it to Charles Minor for a reason. Like, tell me something. They just met each other and they're like, tell me something you've never told any other human being. Like me and Steph are best friends. Like yeah. you guys are three, literally my favorite men in the world. And, you know, and I'm, 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 we're all closer with our wives than any, but any of us, but I, I would, I would share stuff with you guys behind the scenes. But even Steph has never said, well, tell me something you'd never tell anyone else. It's just, it is a like a, a LARP and a shit test at the same time. I just don't, I think this is the way it's commonly expressed in music and movies because these are Judeo Buddhists who it's partly an op and partly, even if they're trying to be honest, they just don't understand Christian marriage because they're not Christian. Well, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that uh, in general, the closer people are to me in my life, the less I feel the need to fill silence with talking just for the sake of it. Like it's an effort for me to do any podcast sometimes because it's most of the talking I ever do. Um, during the week outside work when I'm doing one-to-one -one tutoring with literature students, just constant five, six hours a day and then doing coaching as well. It's constant speech and um, with family as well. I bet you've all had the experience of you can have like a, an intimate quality moment with someone and there's not a lot of talking involved because you yeah. know each other well enough, but with your, with a stranger or like an acquaintance, you can't let any silence hang because they don't know you well enough and it's perceived as standoffish. So a lot of the time, um, intimacy can lead to that closeness where everyone's comfortable, even if you're not opening up because they already have that connection with you. So this um, idea that a wife is constantly asking a husband to reveal deep, dark, secret X from way back when or what he's thinking about right now, that's not something that's been a, a factor in my life, really. I don't know about you, Mike and Tim, but it doesn't really ring a bell with me. The closest thing I got to that actually funny mm. enough was going to confession yesterday for the first time in like 20 years where I like I wrote <laughs> down like all these things I was going to reflect on. She goes, well, how was it? And like, what did you say? I said, well, I said a lot. OK, <laughs> and, then, and then off off we went. But you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm, I relate to Will. I, I spent a lot of the day speaking. So at the end of the day, I don't really feel this need to express that. You know, my wife, you know, knows how much energy I expend um, with the people that I work with. And it's just nice to hear her talk. <laughs> and we can share those moments of even just kind of silence at the table, just, you know, after prayer with children and just enjoying each other's company without much said at all. It's never a question that's ever been posed to me. I wouldn't even know how to answer it. I would just say, I, I don't know. <laughs> Any parting shots? That's, that's all I have on my outline here. I think it's a super important episode to cover. Because a lot of the questions, to me anyway, um, are granting some red pill assumptions that I wouldn't grant in the first place. I think this fear that guys have that any form of um, affection and companionship is necessarily simping is totally misguided. Is That's why they can't, they're not going to get married, first of all. But if they do get married, they often ruin their marriages with that exact set of assumptions. You want to make your wife still feel like a woman. And that involves sometimes having her get her, you know, getting lost in your affection and your presence. There's nothing wrong with that. Where guys typically go wrong with that is that they're seeking so much validation from them where a man whose cup is overflowing and he's got so, so much to give, he's giving out of the goodness and love of his heart. There's a big distinction there between your cup being empty and you're like, I just I just want some of my wife's attention because I'm so you know, my cup is so empty. It's like, well, that, I think those two that those contexts could not be that more different. When a man is giving because he's got so much to give, I think it's a beautiful thing. You should do that shower your wife with love there's nothing simping about simpy about it like it, what a absolutely retarded concept zoomers got to get outside and talk to more women in, in person yeah and stop like yeah. pontificating inside their mom's basements like this is where this comes from yeah
I could couldn't agree more. Well, that's what I kept thinking. Um, I was talking about that at one point. I would just say also, in 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 total agreement with everything Mike and Will have said, there's a false dichotomy created by the dialogue between simps and red pill guys. It's a false dichotomy because red pill guys are just simps who learn to game the system. So between gamey simps and simpy simps. And that, that informs a lot of what we do on this channel, by the way, if you're taking the meta narrative and the, and the meta analytical approach to well, how do men and women relate to each other? Nature, dipshit. It's just, it's nature. <laughs> so when you get uh, a gamey simps talking to simpy simps and they're like, do you express affection? Do you not? Do you this? Uh, you, everyone's asking the wrong question. Of course you express affection. That's like central to our life. What they're not asking is what actually is affection metaphysically. Mm -hmm. And I think that last question was a great penultimate parting shot because affection is not talk, 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 talk. Tell me, tell me something no one's ever known. You know, Michael Scott to Charles Minor. Affection is Dasein. It's being there through the thick, through the thin, through sickness, through health. And trying to be, you know, to dignify yourself and the other through the entire process. And again, one last thing I think of with, with regard to my wife, because, you know, I knew her in her teens. I, I was 20, but she was 18. And anybody with their wife, once they've actually traveled the path and they have some significant amount of the hike behind them, the intimacy is also just all that road behind you. So... They don't have to ask, oh, what about this? What did you do when you're this? What would, you know, how did it make you feel in middle school when uh, Big Tommy pulled down your pants in front of all the girls or whatever? Like, you don't have to <laughs> ask all these questions because like Steph was there and there was no Big Tommy that pulled down my pants um, in front of the girls. But she was there for <laughs> victories and losses and sorrows and joys um, over the last 20 plus years. So part of it's just, creating enough intimacy to suffice for the time to keep going on and realize we have a really special rapport, you get together, then you're going to get that path behind you just by taking it, I think, unpretentiously day by day. Let's just see see what comes our day, like, like the gospel says, like Jesus says, our Lord in the gospel. Don't worry about tomorrow's concerns. Today's are enough. Today's concerns are enough. That's how it is for you as a couple. I mean, like Edmund Dantes says, Troubles are going to come your way in marriage. Every young married couple who are romantics are like, oh, trouble through the thick, through the thin. The thin really does fly at you and it hits you in the eyeball and, yep. it, and it's scary and life will happen to you and it feels like shit when it does. I mean, you, it's scary. So life will happen. Just let a, a, a boring, normal day where you're just, you know, walk in, be, be silent or talk about just normal things. Let it happen in real time. Everything doesn't have to be a production. And the bad times will remind you retroactively later. Wow. those that What I thought was a good day where there wasn't any big production, I might have thought it was boring at the time, but I long for that because things are going a million miles an hour and daughter's brain surgeries and this and that, like... <laughs> I just want to relax with you. We don't have to be in fever pitch the whole time. So I think my thing is just be real. And, um, you know, young men who are looking for a woman, the, the one for you is going to be the best fit match who you can just be real with. And, and, and vice versa. Um, ba baked into the idea of love as a willing of the objective good of the beloved is the fact that you're not going to be simping because simping isn't loving. It's not honoring. It's putting her somewhere she's not supposed to be. So if you understand love properly, you understand that marriage is about companionship, the one flesh union, you know the proper place of affection, romance, etc. in that. And I find it really comically ironic how the lion is often used as like the mascot of the red pill attitude to women. You know, like it's got multiple women, and if you want to be alpha, you'd be like a lion. And you even see in lion prides, there's uh, there's one lioness that is like the preferred one. And if that one dies, then the lion's going to mourn for months sometimes, not eat properly. So there's even like a level of affection there between brute animals that some of the red pill 
humans are afraid to give because they're worried it's simping. Even lions do it. Even your ultimate alpha creature does it. Yeah, I totally agree with what Tim said about a false dichotomy and which is just kind of illustrates the importance of, of the work that we're doing because there's so many Christian men that are just utterly clueless because the church hasn't really explained it in this way. Not so at all. It, it just, it, it's been such a poor example. So now there's exists these two dichotomies of the sim culture and, 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 or this one dichotomy of the sim culture and, and the red pill culture. And the common thread between the two of them is too, is a lot of these guys are just coomers. Okay. They're walking around with porn brain. And so porn brain coupled with this like uh lack of direction from the church inevitably invariably leads to chaos where it's like, you know, if you understand that marriage is a process of becoming, it's not a destination, it's a continual path. And again, combining those elements of grace, humility, prudence, and testicular fortitude, you know, I've never really had to worry about it. And my marriage is, is great. And I think people overcomplicate it. And that's why I think, you know, we should probably do a part three on this because there's probably more to be said. Guys really need this stuff spelled out. But I think if you go back and listen to the first one and this one a couple times over again, you'll realize that this sort of overarching premise is it's actually quite simple. Stop being Buck a Owens said it best. A act natural from my from my home hometown, Bakersfield. Act natural. That's that's like Aristotle says, act natural. It'll work. Great parting shots, guys. And uh, we're solving all of those things that you listed out, Mike, one at a time, marriage, pornography, simping through our various enterprises here. Yes, so, sir. If you guys want to get married, go to the link in the description. And thanks for watching. And we will see everybody next week. God Peace. bless, guys. See ya. God bless.